Abby and Shirley. Y'all ever seen one of these? <laughs> All right, and, and that's an affirmation. For those who haven't, it's called a typewriter. Um, these were radical technologies a few years ago. And by guidance of some family members of mine, I was invited to try to slow down a little bit to practice some slow communication more during this Advent season. So I tried uh, to write today's sermon on a typewriter. And I will admit, I did get two pages done. But that took me a little bit more time than I expected, so the rest of it is on the newer of the technologies. So uh, if you would bear with me, well, we experience a challenge. Preparing for the worst. We all know how to do it. I totally bombed that exam. That paper was horrible. I will absolutely fail this class. It's absolutely going to rain on our wedding on our wedding day. Hold on. Those are sniffles. That a sore throat. I'm definitely getting COVID. Do we have enough toilet paper? Do we have enough flashlights in our batteries? Friends, there's something in our DNA, something encoded within the deepest parts of ourselves, survival of the fittest. Prepare for the worst case scenario. Don't get your hopes up. Murphy's Law rules. Things won't work out. Of course, some of us are facing the very worst in these unprecedented days. But prepare for the worst. Is this the divine summons we hear from the wild? Is this the word from the wilderness as Advent announces peace from the camel-haired clad prophet? Prepare for the Lord, not for the worst. Prepare for the Messiah, the anointed one, Christos. The one who is Advenio coming is more powerful than I and who will baptize not with water but with the Holy Spirit. What does such preparation look like, and why must we do it? Addressing the why first might help us get to the what. Why prepare? Because it is a matter of life and death. Sweet wild honey and locust-eating John shows up linked to Isaiah's prophetic trumpeting to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. These, of course, are words of jubilee, as Isaiah 40 is longing for an actual road through the desert for the exiles to return from Babylonian bondage to Jerusalem's freedom. And into this valley lifting, mountain humbling, emancipatory context comes the child of Elizabeth and Zechariah, the one who leaps in Elizabeth's womb upon first meeting his cousin Jesus, growing in pregnant Mary. The backstory is important for us to remember, as recorded in Luke's account. John's father, Zechariah, upon learning that his presumed barren wife is to bear a child, expresses fear in the form of disbelief of the angelic message, and so loses his voice for the length of Elizabeth's pregnancy. As John is born and his voice returns, Zechariah immediately sings praises. You, child, he says to his son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before God to give knowledge of liberation to the people by the forgiveness of sins, by the tender mercy of our God. The dawn on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in gloom and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the very ways of peace. So John's arrival on this second Sunday of Advent focused on peace makes great sense. But the presence of John the Baptizer at the onset of Mark's Gospel hints at something far more deep than a tranquility. John's arrival on this day, thank you again, Salam Emily, Evie, and Shirley, is the arrival not of Dona Nobis Pachem, as we understand it always, not as not the arrival of I've got peace like a river or peace salam shalom, but the arrival of a peace that unsettles. The presence of this wild baptizer 
offers a different kind of peace than one linked to tranquility or calm or the absence of conflict. To follow that song, I've got peace like a river, ocean, or fountain. If you really contemplate these embodiments of water, none of them are particularly tame or placid. In fact, an ethicist scholar friend of mine who is planning a trip next fall to the Holy Lands to do a deep dive investigation on the famed Jordan River, including its geomorphological, ecological, and theological truths, informed me that there are places along its meandering path where people actually whitewater kayak. I did not know this. There are some significant cataracts along this very water course where John baptizes preparing for a peace of turbulent liberation. For we find evidence of such waves in the very first lines from Mark's gospel, so well read by Anne this morning, right before John is mentioned. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the child of God. This is revolutionary speak. When we hear this line, our sometimes overly biblically domesticated ears hear a simple introductory statement. Yet to those in the Markan community who first heard them, they would have immediately paid attention for this mashup of words was intentionally provocative. At the time of Jesus, we remember the Greek word we translate as good news, euangelion, or gospel, certainly did not apply to a book or a written account of the life in the times of Jesus. Instead, it was a well-known term linked to empire. It was a pronouncement of peace, yes, but following an imperial battle or conquest. It could also be applied to the good news event like an emperor's birthday or an imperial visit to a distant corner of the empire. So in, in applying this word to something beyond empire, Mark is doing something innovative, something new, something risky. And then to link Jesus to Messiah, Christos, anointed one, a term reserved for kings of Israel to the high priest, to certain prophets, or a king of King Cyrus of Persia, was certainly eyebrow-raisingly abnormal. And furthermore, to use another common imperial moniker, child of God, or frequently translated son of God, to another other than the empire, let alone the renegade rabbi from Nazareth, was downright dangerous, clearly confrontational. The literal translation of the Hebrew of the quoted lines from Isaiah about sending a messenger before you is, Behold, I send the messenger of me before the face of you. John here is getting up in our face. The entomological roots of the word confrontation via the Middle French and Latin is forehead to forehead. Face to face conflict. Not for the sake of a fight, but for the sake of getting to the truth. A vantage point that speaks of hiding nothing, bringing one's full self forward, forehead to forehead, with the hope of bringing deeper wisdom. Two minds, eye to eye, better than one. John is set and sent before Jesus to prepare the way. John is sent as a forerunner of peace, but a peace that radically contrasts with the way of empire. Roman peace, Pax Romana, was a cheap peace, for it arrived by the sword, by the use of the cross to silence dissent. But in contrast, John preaches nonconformity, a deep peace through repentance. Again, we hear this word, images of people who have committed sins rise up when we hear of repentance, saying, I am sorry for what I've done. But a deeper meaning here is metanoia deep change, a change that begins in the mind, leads to the heart, and finally enters the body and to a change of behavior. Now, such, such change feels deeply impossible in these days of entrenched perspective, disregard for data, politicization of mask wearing, science being questioned, truth being questioned in the blossoming of conspiracy theories. Over the Thanksgiving Zoom virtual tables this year, did anyone either engage in a difficult conversation or perhaps wisely avoid one in the often quite painful landscape that can be different political views within family? If you're anything like me, the strong, strong temptation is to avoid such conflict at all costs and to maintain the peace. 
But I think the Advent message of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, is one that such peace is a false peace. And there is a much deeper peace to which we are being invited in the ways of faith. Priya Parker, author of The Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters, writes, Human connection is threatened by an unhealthy peace. It is as threatened by an unhealthy peace as it is by unhealthy conflict. Her point is that when we maintain a false peace, we are leading ourselves into a falseness that infects many and therefore affects the entirety of the community. And using the example of the Thanksgiving Day table, Parker offers us some practical advice and says that to bring about some pop-up rules, we might counter that requisite ban on talking politics or religion within family units. We might find a certain safety net by saying, okay, we can no longer talk about opinions. We need to instead share personal stories. Stories specifically about times where you have experienced using I, me language, belonging or exclusion, or when your mind was changed. Such an invitation transforms the idea of disparate table talk, throwing opinions at one another and so condemning and shutting down conversation, but opens us up to the, Lord, the land language of stories, the language of John walking in the wilderness before Jesus, the language of forehead to forehead, the image of face to face, eye to eye, in craving a deeper wisdom that may emerge. Peace allowing ourselves to be seen and seeing fully the other. I often wonder what makes locust eating John so popular. So much of the whole Judean countryside and the people of Jerusalem gather around him. There was certainly probably something about his wild authenticity that drew people out of their homes. But I imagine, too, there was a chance for a public ritual of truth-telling that drew people. A chance to tell their stories in a real way. To confess, to, tr to tell the truth, is what Jesus John is inviting people to do here in the waters of baptism to tell the truth and to be therefore set free. I imagine John spending a lot of time intentionally face-to-face -face listening to those who confessed their sins. People's pain, people's desires to turn, their desires for deeper connection, for deeper justice in their land. And in all of this, there begins to be an authenticity that spreads. And yet, as Luke's gospel reminds us, many who came to be baptized still remain confused about what John meant by prepare the way of the Lord. They ask the question, what we all ask too on this second Sunday in Advent, what does peace look like? They ask John, what then should we do? And John offers them very specifics in Luke's gospel. Whoever has two coats must share with another who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. And to the tax collectors, he says, collect no more amount than that which is prescribed for you. To the soldiers, he says, do not exhort money from anyone. Be satisfied with your wages. John preaches a practical generosity, a form of jubilee. Share, love your neighbors by ensuring that they have what they need. Understand that your peace is directly connected to the peace of those around you. Such generosity, such solidarity is an essential part of our Advent journey. As we light our own candles, I love that we're each lighting candles, not just one in one sanctuary, but many in many sacred spaces. When we light the one of peace, let's remember there is a requirement for connection. For friends, peace is taking part in the mutual aid networks that have sprung up more powerfully, I would say, than any virus in our land. Peace is taking a cue from our deacons who are fiercely loving each of us in this congregation through these hard, hard times. Peace is once again offering to grocery shop for our neighbors who may have underlying conditions or young kids at home in the midst of this now shocking COVID surge we are facing. Peace is following the lead of our Nika companions who are actively engaging our siblings in Dulce Nombre de Jesus in Nicaragua, asking how can we best support you in the light of the climate violence that they have been experiencing in the form of multiple hurricanes devastating their crops. Peace is giving a gift 
to the women's lunch place, as you see in your bulletin. There is a listserv that you can plug into. So too, Peace is doing our best. I know that Women's Lunch Place is using Amazon, but that's one reason to use Amazon. Peace is doing our best to avoid using Amazon the rest of this Advent season, being willing to place our own needs for instant stuff being dropped at our doorstep aside and helping to confront this retail behemoth whose CEO is now worth $185 billion. I know it's hard, especially during a, pan during a pandemic, some of us have to purchase in this way. But peace requires us a self-examination to remember those frontline Amazon workers whose health is directly connected to our consumption choices. Peace is not easy, friends. But like the non-crooked highway in the desert, it is liberating. And we know the fuller story of the prophetic call of John. His jubilee message and association with the radical Jesus who comes after him is, of course, seen as a threat. He is arrested and killed by Herod. The powers against peace are real, but unless countered, they will concede nothing. Thank you, Frederick Douglass, for telling us, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want an ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Peace concedes nothing without a demand. Dr. King picked that up, of course, again. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. But friends, thankfully, the voices of Douglas King, Sojourner, Fannie Lou, are still heard today. They have not been silenced by the principalities and powers of empire. Just as the voice of the baptizer was not quenched by Herod, but is echoed and amplified by the one who followed. That Ruah-filled, anointed one, Christ of peace, was not silenced by Caesar or the cross, but lives and shines today in so many, paces, so many places. Are we looking in the flicker of today's Advent candle, in the glow of last week's, week's hope burning into the faces of what feel like chaos, burning in the faces of candle lighters like Shirley and Evie and frontline ER doctor moms and hardworking dads. The shine of Christ is realized in all face-to-face -face faces who desire to confront the cheap peace that ignores the lies and injustices around us with a wild, nonviolent commitment to deep peace. So friends, our invitation this Advent, our preparing for the Lord is not preparing for the worst, but preparing for the best. Not referring to a blind form of optimism here, but an orientation to the positivity that says, each day I will experience grace. Each day there will be a gift to be uncovered. Each day there will be an invitation to walk in peace. Yes, we still need to buy extra batteries and toilet paper, but we also need to make sure our neighbors have them too. Preparing for peace, preparing for the best, does not mean avoiding that which is bad, but remembers that the places where hope is being born is everywhere we look. Because even in far off forgotten Nazareth, growing there is the fierce love of today's Elizabeths and Marys. For comfort, comfort, you are all my people, thus says our God. And the good news of deliverance and liberation through the one of peace will break forth once again.